Hey, let's talk about why we're here. We're here because it's November and it's time to talk about WCW 1998. We've had a lot of fun breaking down things from 1998 because of course it's the 25 year anniversary. And this is going to be a fun show because world war three always seemed like just absolute chaos to me. What do you remember being the overall idea and concept? I mean, a lot of people would think, well, this was WCW's version of a Royal rumble. Of course you couldn't just do a direct copy of that battle Royals are as old as the day is long. We, we've mentioned war games earlier and, and we had a two ring opportunity there. Now we've got three rings. Hey, what's better than two rings. It's a third one. Talk me through the thinking of world war three and, and, and who you remember first bringing the idea up and were you a fan of just the concept? I, I don't know who came up with the idea initially. It could have been me because I was looking for a way to all the pay-per-views. I wanted each one of them to have something about them that was unique that you didn't see any other time of the year. Halloween Havoc was obviously themed around Halloween <clears throat> and from Vegas. We didn't, I don't think we did any other shows from Vegas. Um, Clash of the Champions. Sturgis. Not much. Uh, Clash of the Champions. Yeah, we did that. Uh, Sturgis, another example. Uh, NWO sold out. Hate to bring it up, but another example. Every We tried to give each one of the pay-per-views a personality, and I think for World War III, it was, wait a minute, why not have three cages, and let's make the cage a part of the show. Let's make it a star in the show. Not just a prop, not just something that's dangerous, because other people have made, you know, the cage a part of the show as well. Look, well there's no cage in a World War Three match, here. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're thinking it. of War Games. Yeah, I'm thinking of War Games. Uh, World War Three was just about creating a spectacle. Yeah. Doing something that had never been done before and giving that pay-per-view its own personality. Well, and we're doing it a couple of months before the Royal Rumble. Of course, we get started. Uh, this is the monthly pay-per-view era. So as soon as you finish a pay-per-view the next day, you've got to start new stories that are going to pay off a month later and the pay-per-view that we're following up Halloween havoc, 1998. And you've described Halloween havoc on this program before as being sort of the WCW equivalent of WrestleMania. Of course, there is no equivalent based on name. Yeah, It was an think, attempt to make it a yeah. WrestleMania. Yeah, there you go. And I think a lot of wrestling fans assumed. Well, no, it's, it's Starcade. Starcade's the big show. That's your WrestleMania. And, and you said, well, internally, we kind of felt like it was Halloween Havoc. And what a big one it was in 98. We got the rematch between the Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan. And, well, the less said about that, the better. Thank you. But the, the real main event is DDP and Goldberg. And what an incredible pairing that was. I think it's one of Goldberg's best matches in WCW. For that matter, it's one of... Uh, Dallas is as well. He manages to get knocked out in the middle of the show, but keeps going. And not everybody got to see it because the show went long. And I guess the word was not out the way it should have been to all the pay-per-view systems that they needed some more satellite time. So a lot of folks who plopped down their 30 or 35 bucks did not get to see the finish of that. There's going to be a flood of complaints and you guys make the decision to just show the match on nitro the next day. And of course the critics of WCW at the time would say, Oh, it's a ratings ploy. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You'd never just give away the map. I mean, that's silly, but it feels like you're trying to make the best of it. Make a little chicken salad. If you will, is that the way you remember that going down? Yeah, there was no choice. Well, there were two choices, a horrible choice and a choice that was worse than horrible. <laughs> and that's, there was no way to win in that scenario. Had we not at least covered our ass to the extent that we showed it so that everybody that did spend their money and didn't get the match were able to see it. And it's a piss ant chicken shit make good. But the alternative was to say, whoops, sorry. I mean, talk about a rock and a hard place. Um, I'd probably make the same decision today. In fact, I know I would given the same exact circumstances, but it was ugly. No, no way to win. No way to come up with a good idea because it wasn't like we could even reach out just the nature of pay-per-view and the billing systems. 
you know, you live in a little town in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, or where I live in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, you've got a local cable system and that's who you purchase your pay-per-view from. Right. That was back then. And there's thousands of those little companies all over the country. And if you can imagine trying to manage the refund process in that environment, it was just impossible. We couldn't even offer people their money back realistically. It would have been too hard to administer and, and, and execute. So it was like, okay, do we want to get kicked in the balls or do we want to get kicked in the teeth? Which one do you prefer? It's like the Rob Van Dam story, you know, whenever, whenever you get pissed off at somebody, put his two hands out and say, which one? <laughs> Cause you're going to get knocked out by one of them. It's kind of what that was like. Well, the result is, and I don't think this gets talked about enough because I know that people like to dunk on WCW as a whole because, well, the pay-per-view went long and allegedly at the time there was fears that maybe 25% of people who ordered the pay-per-view would have missed that match which would mean that you're probably going to be getting refunds or refund requests rather in the seven figure range. But the result of showing it on TV the next night is incredible. A 7.18 rating. That is the all time record. You'd have to go back 10 years for, to find a match that could have beaten it, which was flair and sting at the first clash of the champions back in 88, that did a 7.8, but still a 7.18 Eric. That's uh crazy like a fox huh no no it, like i said there was there was no celebration nobody was high-fiving over that rating i can assure you it, it was a bad situation yeah got a great rating and a lot of people that didn't buy the buy the pay-per-view got a chance to see it good for them but yeah it was it was ugly internally it was ugly a little trivia note that show winds up being the last time WCW wins the Monday night war. How about that? Wow. What, and what was that date? Uh, we're, we're talking uh, on the heels of Halloween havoc, 1998. Yeah. Yeah. A couple months later, things were going to start going downhill real fast. Of course, behind the scenes, uh, Titan sports is telling viewers choice that this was intentional trying to fracture the relationship between Turner and the pay-per-view provider. So you actually have Tony Schiavone go out and address this. And it's also reported that you had planned that night to spoil the taped episode of Monday night raw, where it had Steve Austin and Ken Shamrock as the main event. Now you did this a lot in the early days of nitro. You decide against doing it here. Do you remember why you would have made that decision? No, I don't remember making the decision to do it. So I certainly don't remember the decision not to, and I'm not even sure that that's real. Okay. Who reported it? Maybe it was. I just have absolutely zero recall of that. Do you recall Horace Hogan being introduced as the newest member of the NWO? Yeah, I do. Whoa. What is that about? Well, why'd you say it like that? Bad choice, bad casting. Horace wasn't ready for that. There was a lot of pressure on him. Um, it just was what it was. It was it, like putting people, we just talked about, you know, Ronda Rousey being cast in, in the wrong role in it, basically tainting the rest of her career in WWE. At least we talked about Drew McIntyre. Maybe he's going to be better as a heel than he was at a baby face. It's all casting and making sure that the talent that you're putting a spotlight on is ready for that spotlight in every way. Mentally, physically, emotionally, professionally, and also able to live up to the expectations. Now, when you bring in Hulk Hogan's nephew, guess what? Yeah. You got heat before you step into the ring, people. Not, not money heat. You just got disgusted heat before you even start. Eric Watts ended up with the same problem, right? doesn't matter how good you are. The fact that you're getting that position because of nepotism or perceived nepotism. In this case, it was nepotism. It wasn't perceived. It was real. Um, put Horace in a bad spot. He, he, was, he just wasn't going to be successful as a result of that. It's not that he didn't have the ability. It's not that he couldn't have grown into that. It's not that he couldn't have become a bigger star had he not been cast into that role as Hulk Hogan's nephew. But once he was, man, you're, 
you're shackled with that. And overcoming that is way harder than becoming good in the first place. And it's hard. It's hard to it's hard to make it in any form of entertainment, whether you're a ballet dancer or a musician or whatever. It's hard to make it to the top. Even harder when you're saddled with that nepotism stigma. 